All right, y'all. Welcome to episode eight, <laughs> Behind the Gate, Greensboro Base Podcast. I am your host, Andrew Westmoreland, all about you, Realty. We are here with one of my favorite human beings in the world, <laughs> Coach Joe Franks. We're in the field house at Grimsley High School, where he was a teacher for a number of years, well known, well respected. We're sitting outside the football field, which happens to be called Joe <laughs> Franks Football Field. And uh, I think I'm done embarrassing a little bit, but he's. He's an extremely well-known man. He's done so much for the community, for high school sports. He's been on the state level board. He's written a book. He's mentored, coached, been involved with Clemson Athletics. He's probably the number one Clemson fan in the world. (laughs) And the list goes on and on and on. But if you haven't had an opportunity to meet him, you will never forget him. And I'm so excited that he's here with us. So thank you, Coach Franks, for joining us. And, uh, you know, talking about being in the field house here in Grimsley, this backdrop has a lot of history. So tell us about about where we are and what it means. Absolutely. First of all, thanks very much for the intro. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, this field house in Jamison Stadium, which is still the largest on campus high school stadium in North Carolina, this field house is a World War II memorial. And the Pearl family dedicated this to Sigmund Sillig Pearl, a Greensboro senior high graduate who was one of 99 Greensboro senior high graduates that died in World War II. So uh, this field house is a World War II memorial here in Greensboro. That's incredible. I never knew that. Yep. Somehow I wrestled in We used to practice wrestling right over there, and I've I've actually never been in this little room. This is such a cool little scenario It is. I've got to hand it to Grimsley Athletic Director Ethan Albright, who is extremely patriotic and and has uh, one of his family uh, relatives uh, was one of the Greensboro Senior High uh, students, graduates, who died in World War II. So Ethan takes it to heart. Ethan's incredible, and he was very gracious to let us use this room today. So thank you, Ethan. Um, <laughs> let's let's take it back to your student days at Clemson. Now, if I get any of this incorrect, please feel free to jump in. Share some of your most memorable moments being involved with that 1981 Clemson team as a student, uh, athletic trainer, I believe. And uh, let's talk yep. about that some. Well, you know, I was at Grimsley from 1975, graduated in 1978, went to Clemson in the fall of 1978, uh, was, a, was a student athletic trainer at Grimsley High School. I mean, I, that's what I did during my high school years and uh, was able to continue that down to Clemson. It was a fantastic experience. Um, the 1981 season, uh, you know, was magical, obviously. And the cool thing about it was you, we didn't have ESPN. You didn't have the Internet. You didn't have 24-hour sports. Um, so, you know, we, it was almost like we we're in a little bubble and, uh, you start out, you know, three and oh, four and oh, five and oh, six and oh, and then, you know, you start thinking we've got a chance to, to be a part of something really, really special. And, uh, one of the things that I enjoyed tremendously was the fact that I lived in the athletic dorm with the football players. Uh, and so it really became a family. We were, we were very close and, and still are. I mean, when we have reunions, um, you know, to, to be able to see each other, to get together and, and just rehash the old times was uh, was great. But, you know, to win a national championship, to beat Nebraska um, down in the Orange Bowl on January 1, 1982, uh, you know, obviously that, that was magical. And, and I don't think that everybody that was involved with the program knew exactly how big that was, uh, but that became evident you know, as the years passed, you know, and that's a little bit before my time of being a big history <laughs> and sports buff. Correct. I mean, like Nebraska was football. Back oh yeah, then, absolutely. Right? I mean, and, and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't you kind of a Carolina guy? I'm and, a Carolina uh, guy. Yeah. So if you go back to the 1981 game between Clemson and North Carolina and Chapel Hill was the first time that two ACC teams in the top 10 had met ever. And North Carolina, as a matter of fact, had Rod Elkins as their quarterback, uh, who was a Grimsley grad, an absolutely fantastic person, and, and a, a great, great player. Uh, and Clemson won that game 10-8. to 10-8. 10-8 that, that day in Chapel Hill. 
Unbelievable. Wow. I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, I guess we had the last couple of years. I didn't never know UNC was ranked in the top 10 in football. Oh, yeah. so. Absolutely. <laughs> Go Tar Heels. Um, and let's, the experiences that you learned being around that, being around a program and just kind of having that, how do you feel like moving into your education kind of shaped you as a teacher and then as moving into coaching as a coach? Well, I think that, um, my experience at Clemson working for a, a legend uh, in athletic training and sports medicine, Fred Hoover, um, that helped shape me becoming uh, a certified athletic trainer and directing a, a sports medicine program here at Grimsley High School, which is what I did for 17 years before I got into coaching. Um, I was a major uh, secondary education major history uh, came in here and uh, began teaching U.S. history and sociology, eventually took over psychology, and that's kind of what I was known for, social psych. They were, they were senior electives. They were fantastic classes. We could do a whole you know, program on that. Um, but I still remember, y'all, if y'all didn't know this, I was not great at school. He, he knows this. Um, I still remember the aha in incubation effect absolutely from your class. It, it's amazing that the things that you remember uh it, it's fantastic yeah and and the the other thing you know talking about teaching career and that kind of thing you know i always looked at it as a partnership between myself and my students uh you know we, we were doing this together and uh, that's that's what made it so special we may we may come back to that but uh, directing the sports medicine program, which was recognized throughout the state. It really was. We had, uh, you know, in, in its heyday, uh, we had like 15, 16 student trainers. We sent student trainers with every sport, varsity and JV, here, here at Grimsley. And they, they did an awful lot of things. We had uh, our, our general practice physician, Dr. John Lalonde, who's still in Greensboro, and he's still practicing. Johnson in two Olympics. And, and he also worked with UNCG. So we had a, 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 a sports medicine, you know, doc, general practitioner, and our orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Jim Applington, uh, at Greensboro Orthopedics, now Emerge Ortho. But that was our, you know, we had a team. Um, we had a team. And, and it was fantastic. Uh, and I did that for 17 years before I got into coaching. Do you feel like, I know there's a huge emphasis now in sports, do you feel like back then that was more of an emerging type thing, the sports medicine side of things? Um, or was it as in, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you had your athletic trainers and then, yeah. the, you know, you had your NATA certified uh, athletic trainers and sports medicine programs were growing. Um, at that time in, in the late 1970s, uh, East Carolina had a fantastic uh, program with an athletic trainer director named Rod Compton. Uh, who did who did a super super job? Uh, you had North Carolina. You know, one of the famous doctors at, at UNC was Dr. Tim Taft, and uh, you know everybody who was in sports medicine. You know, knew Tim Taft. Um, I was fortunate to work for Fred Hoover, who was nationally recognized. And uh, as a matter of fact, Coach Jameson during the coaching clinic uh, back in the uh, early 1960s and the mid 60s would bring uh, Fred Hoover up to the coaching clinic to talk on athletic training. So, but but. Since the 1970s and the 80s, it has grown. It has grown, um, you know. And now, uh, it it just. I mean, it's a it's a field that is in demand. Yeah. There is no doubt about it. Well, let's change gears up on you a little bit. Thank you for sharing all that. It's your your ability to recollect people <laughs> is just. We'll we'll touch on that a little right, bit because it's, it's mind blowing at times. This bag right here, this Grimsley golf bag. I don't know if we can I'm gonna show this up to the camera here. Tell us about this golf bag. Well, you know, obviously this, this golf bag is ancient. And uh, when it was given to me, when I, I started coaching men's golf here at Grimsley in 1997, spring of 1997, uh, did men's golf for 17 years, did women's golf, started in 03, did that for 10 years. And this bag was given to me, I, if memory serves, it was given to me by Mary Jane Beavers, and you know, you know MJ very well. Um, she said, can you use this bag? And for a while, it was just in a closet that, that had things stored in it. And my first golfer that went to the state tournament was a guy named Cam Gibbs in 2000, and the, uh, the state tournament was in, uh, at, in Chapel Hill at Finley Golf Course. And, and so... I said, I got this bag. What can I do with this bag? 
And I figured, well, I've got my first one that went to a state tournament. So how about I'm going to let every kid that plays for me, that goes to the state tournament, that plays for Grimsley, sign this bag. And so we started that, and Cam's got his signature on it, and we took our first team in 2001, okay? And, uh, you know, we had a great run. Uh, we really did. We, we had top four finishes. We had your senior year. We were state runner-up. Okay. Still hurts. And uh, we were state runner up to, to, a, to an excellent Green Hope team mm-hmm. that had Brendan Todd as their number one player who went to the University of Georgia and now still playing on the PGA Tour. So, few, few time winner on the tour. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a, he's a champ. Let me tell you something about Brendan Todd, though. Now, Brendan was a senior at Green Hope, and our number one golfer going into the state tournament was a young man named Jake Chaminsky. And Jake was a sophomore at that mm-hmm. time. And Jake, you know, obviously was nervous going into the state tournament playing. And um, I think Jake, in one of his first few holes, maybe hit, you know, shot double, you know, he had a double bogey. And he was, he was down a little bit, you know. And, and Brennan Todd, to his credit, Jake will never forget it. He came up, he said, Coach, this was the most cool thing. He said, Brennan Todd came up to me and patted me on the back and said, don't worry about it, dude. You're a good player. You'll get it back. And so Jake was the, Jake was the runner-up medalist. You know, to Brendan Todd Mm -hmm. and uh, as a sophomore uh, at Grimsley. So, you know, it was just, I mean, it was cool. We we got to play, and I know I'm running my mouth, but we got to play against an an awful lot of great players. Drew Weaver, who was at High Point Central, was a British amateur champion. We Mm -hmm. got to play against... Webb Simpson, of course, at uh, at Raleigh Broughton, and uh, had had some real dog fights, you know, uh, with those guys uh, in state tournaments, um, which was really cool. But this this bag became very very special. There's an awful lot. Of, your signature is on here, Utah. and the guys okay. uh, they would sign on the beige area. And then when we started taking girls teams to the state championship, the girls signed in silver ink on the blue. So, you know, it's really, really, really special. Um, you know, that's, I think what, what I need to do is kind of make this like the Stanley Cup uh, and let former players hold it for a while. And uh, I think you're, you're going to end up playing in the, uh, in the Brian Futures tournament with some of our golf alumni. So yep. maybe I ought to just let you hold on to this and, and take it that day and, and make it like the Stanley Cup and let it let it just kind of float around. We might have to figure out how to put a beer funnel in there somewhere. <laughs> but, yeah, we can do that. I don't know about that. It's not it's not <laughs> Al Chervik's bag from Caddyshack. But, uh, um, but anyway, it's pretty cool. It's a very, very special uh, memento. Uh, for me, from my, my times of coaching and, and great uh, history uh, from, from those years when we won a bunch of regional tournaments and were very competitive in the state. And I'll tell you, a testament to you, y'all, if you can see this, first name, Cam Gibbs. Cam, what's up? Grew up together. One name in 2000 was on this bag. That was it? That was in 2000. And if you guys can see this, this thing is tattooed with not just male but female golfers bunch of names on there very very special and you you built a program coach well, that was you were just as much a part of that as any of us being able to hit a golf ball we uh like this is incredible it was a golfing family it certainly was and yeah. and uh very very special times i think it's special times for the players and special times for me and my family absolutely Every, everybody knows the golf bag yeah well, well we could spend a lot of time talking about this um what do you believe are the key components to being a successful mentor? And I'm going to I'm gonna pause on that word because it's special to me because, and I know I've told you this and I've told a lot of people in my life that you are still one of the, one of the best mentors I've ever had and in times where I probably needed a few kicks in the butt. And it, so that, that's always going to be special to me. Components of successful mentorship and – how have you applied those to those mentoring relationships that you've had over the years? The bottom line is, you know, when you've got, well, I don't care whether it's a student or, or what a, whoever you're working with or a player that you're coaching, you know, as long as that student knows that you genuinely care about them, then they will tend to listen to you. You know, it's not something that uh, a teacher or a coach uh, can stand up and just, you know, yell at a young person. I mean, that, that, that is no good. They're going to shut you off in a heartbeat. Uh, the bottom line is when, when they know that you care, 
then they're going to listen. They're going to pay attention. And then it's that opportunity to work together to accomplish something that's going to be beneficial for them. And in turn, it's going to be beneficial for you. I think um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I used to give a talk the day before spring break. We all know that in, in talk, my, And anybody that's watching this that was in one of my social psych classes, uh, they understand this. Um, the, you know, I would close the door and we would have a heart-to-heart -heart communication uh, before they went to spring break. And uh, I didn't pull any punches. Um, you know, and, and I would have parents come up to me, you know, and thank me. You know, that their son or their daughter told me what you said and how you said it, and I appreciate that. And, and you know, but that was something, that was a connection, you know, that you had. And, and you can't do that. I couldn't have done that in September. But you get to April, you know, and, and you've got that, that relationship with your students. Um, then then you, can, you can talk to them like a young adult, not like a child. Yeah, that was a big because they knew you knew you know I loved you you knew that I mean Never my students knew you know they knew I loved them and and I think that was that was the key they understood that yeah the uh, the old old speech before spring break yeah we we all remember that and you know being thirty eight we still I'm sure there's still a lot of memorable parts about that speech that we won't mention here that that uh, everybody still remembers. And I, I do think to that point, you did talk to us like we were human beings and young adults. And it wasn't that typical, you know, I'm the teacher, you're the right. student. And I think people respected that. And, you know, as being, uh, you know, your class was seniors, you know. And so that's anyway, we we all loved and appreciated that spring break speech um, as, as someone who is deeply involved in education and coaching are there any changes to kind of the current educational system that you feel like could be made that would better support students as, as educators? Don't get me started. <laughs> um, if, look, you want to really address the problems in public education right now, then you need to concentrate on three things. Okay? And those three things, and I mean from day one. I'm talking about from preschool through elementary through middle school through high school. Okay? Three things. Attendance. You got to come to school. You got to be present. Got to show up. You got to show up. Okay? Behavior. All right? I mean, there are certain things that you're able to do and certain things you can't. You know, when I first started teaching, you could tell a student, you wouldn't do that at home, would you? No, I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that in front of your grandma, would you? No, coach, I wouldn't do that. Now, you do that at home? Yeah, I do that at home, so what? I mean, you know... And that just, that would be difficult for me. I've been retired for going on 11 years. It would be difficult for me, you know, uh, to, to, to deal with that. Uh, that would be tough. And the third thing is effort. Give an effort. You got attendance, behavior, and effort. Those three things, if you concentrated that, and as a, <laughs> as a politician, as an educator, I don't care where you come from. You want to improve public education? You focus on those three things, attendance, behavior, and effort, and things will start to improve. Now, it's not going to improve overnight, yeah. okay? It may take a generation of students, but that would be worth the effort, yeah. no doubt. Sure, sweet, and to the point, I, um, I do not have a child in the education system yet, but as now an assistant coach at the golf team, you know, I, I can... I can see where those three things could be lacking, you know, and doesn't mean you don't, I, doesn't mean you don't love them. You know, right. it's just like, uh, so no, I appreciate you being real with that. That's, sure. that's keep it simple. Um, reflecting on your career, proudest accomplishment. Oh my goodness. Um, and you can share more than one. If no, you I mean, you know, I think the, the, the proudest accomplishment was being able to complete a 30-year career here at Grimsley High School. Um, you know, I went to Grimsley. Uh, I told the kids when I did the convocation address 
when I was uh, finishing up, I said, you know, I, I spent three years here as a student because it was sophomore, junior, and senior when I went to school here. Um, had a wonderful experience, and then I came back and taught for 30 years. I was 53 years old, you know, when I, re- when I retired from teaching. Didn't retire from other things, but retired from teaching. And I told them, you know, I, 33 out of my 53 years have been on this campus. And now, you know, that I look back, I'm, I'm still involved. I'm the co-president of the Alumni Association with, you know, with, with Mary Jane Beaver. She's another co-president. Uh, you know, and, and so Grimsley, I was thinking about this yesterday. You know, I, I've been around this campus for, what, 49 years now? Because I set, stepped foot on this campus in 1975. Wow. So I've been around here, you know, Grimsley's been here, my, you know, it's amazing for all those years. I've, I've been a part of Grimsley, and that's, that I think is the greatest accomplishment, is, is being able to, to have finished a career here and still, still being involved. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, and that's fantastic. And I indirectly ran into Coach Franks at an alumni event. I happened to be at the spot for a different event and it was uh, <laughs> yeah it i remember was a, that it, it was very nice to walk in and see coach franks and i happened to be early so i actually got to hang out with the alumni and as people were coming in every face that walked in the door whether they had graduated in 70 75 2003 yep. 2012 when i say you knew their name something about them and even more incredibly, the year that they graduated. Now, I don't know if I remember all those, but... Yeah, I watched it happen. A for, bunch, a bunch, yeah. And it just blew my mind. I think it's a testament to what you said. You, showing people you care. When you're talking to someone, when you're getting to know them, you really, truly show you care. And I, I just thought that was... I was mind-blown. I was like, you know... <laughs> no, I appreciate um, that. You know, so in, anyway, sorry. Um Let's kind of bring that student and education role back over to athletics, because that was also a big, big part of your tenure here. And when it comes to student athletics within the educational system, how do you feel like the kids that choose to get into those positions, what type of developmental role do you feel like the athletics play in the education system, good, bad, ugly. Oh, my gosh. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, and, and kids that are involved in education-based athletics, they do better in school, their attendance is better, their behavior is better, they have less discipline problems, they're going to be more successful, they, they develop better coping skills than, than kids that just sit on the couch and play video games all day long. You know, you have to learn in athletics. First of all, you, you got to get out there and do it and be involved and be there. You remember my attendance, behavior, and effort? Same thing, okay? Um, but how many people can get a young person to put their phone down for two hours? A coach. Because they're going to put their phone down and they're going to be at practice. They're going to have to engage with other people. They're going to have to learn with others. They're going to have to develop social skills. And then it's all about, when you're in athletics, how do you face adversity? Because you're going to face adversity. You're not going to win everything. You're not going to make every shot. Okay? You're not going to make every play. How do you deal with adversity? And that's what you have to learn. And that is a valuable life lesson. So, I mean, there are studies that show that students that are involved in high school athletics, okay, they're going to be more well-rounded and they're going to be more successful, you know? And that's not just in athletics, but that's in life. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I would agree. And, and, and building on that, you know, I think, and this is something that I have had personal struggles with, I got a little bit too focused on the athletic side of that conversation. Right. Absolutely. And because that's, you know, to me, that's what I enjoy the most. I didn't quite <laughs> understand the balance of that. And, you know, there were some time management skills that needed to involve in that too. But how do you take that athlete that maybe is in, in my position that's so passionate about the sport and that's what they take it and still get them to understand that that bounce of the classroom and the athletic is where you're going to see that life skill 
really, really push up. What do you say to somebody that's in that boat? Well, I think the bottom line is, you know, there are eligibility rules and guidelines. You know, if you play in education-based athletics, you know, uh, some states have minimum grade point average, for example. Uh, but you have to pass your you get you got to pass your load. You've got to be you got to have attendance rules. Um, you know, I mean, there there are things that you have to do if you want to play your sport that bad and you're that passionate about it. Well, guess what? You're going to have to learn how not just to perform on the field or the court, but you got to perform in the classroom. You know, and that opens up opportunities for you later on. You can't tell telling a kid that you've got to do this to get a scholarship. I mean, that's the biggest. You know, that that's the biggest bunch of bull. You know that uh, every all these people think my my child's going to get a scholarship. Do you realize how many people play high school athletics that don't get a scholarship? You know, um, that that don't you can't put the carrot out there when that may not be an achievable goal, all right? But if you're talking about developing these skills that we talked about earlier and developing responsibility and developing a work ethic and coping skills, that's going to help you be successful. If you play beyond high school, fantastic. More power, more power to you, you know. But for an awful lot of people when their high school career ends, their sport career ends as, in terms of an organized sport. So they, they've got to be ready to do things that go beyond sports. Yeah. I, I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, well, well said. I don't think I have anything to add to that. That's well <laughs> said. Uh, so let's, let's go down some rapid fire questions here. All We're right. going to completely switch gears. We're just going to get in to know Coach Franks as a person a little bit. <laughs> Favorite movie you've watched in the past year? Past year. Uh, got to be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. That would, I mean, been, I, that know, would have been my last. I mean, last the, in the, but 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 in, in the la, in the last year, there was something when that first one came out, and I didn't see it. And I had a very good friend that I went to high school with, and said, "He said, Joe, he said this is right up your alley. You need to go see." It. And I fell in love with it. I thought it was wonderful, and the volume two was great. And then I loved. You know, I was waiting for volume three to come out, and it did. And I, you know, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the past year, yeah, that's my that's probably my most enjoyable movie of the past oh, year. Surprise. I love it. I wow. I I would have I mean not I I'm kind of speechless. Okay, so on that note, top three albums, musical albums. I, I'm my brain's not picking up what you would call soundtracks. All right. Top three soundtracks of all time. Guardians of the Galaxy one. Have oh, you listened to the record? Oh yeah, every oh, yeah. song on there is a classic. I've got, I've got it on my phone. I mean, I've got it on iTunes. I know, know it's not Caddyshack. No, it's but. not Caddyshack, but it's a uh, you know it, it's classic. I mean, it's just it's it's fantastic. The and the way that the director blended the songs with the action and the storyline, uh, you know, that was very creative. I mean, yeah. it it was tremendous. Love that. Also love those movies. Oh yeah. Um, What's one thing you can't live without? My wife. Tiffany. Oh, yeah. Tiffany, who's the president of Averitt University. And, you know, I've got my little business cards that say, Joe Franks, presidential spouse and Averitt ambassador. I mean, you know, she's finishing her 16th year. I guess we are finishing our 16th year at Averitt. And that up in Danville, um, you know, that was a blessing uh, as well because she got the job in 2008. And the Board of Trustees understood that I had five years to go to complete my 30 years here at Grimsley, teaching, coaching, you know, that kind of thing. And they were cool with it because they knew that, um, that I was going to give Averitt everything I could for those five years. And I had a very, very supportive administration down here that if I had to do something with Averitt, that I was able to do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that was... That was great. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, you know, and it allowed me to continue my work with the North Carolina Coaches Association. So, I mean, we've been blessed uh, to be up in Danville at Averitt. So, yeah, I could not live without Tiffany. There's no doubt about that. Tiffany's incredible. I love her dearly. <laughs> I think so. And I will say that it's been, you know, it, and, and I do think social media and the way that you can 
promote things out to the public certainly helps with this. But when I was growing up right down the road for a Maverick, you know, 45 minutes away. Yep. And, you know, I, I knew what the university was. And even into my early 20s and, and, and early 30s, like, that's Avery University. But the last, it feels like the last eight to 10 years. Now, Danville's seen a lot of growth. And I think yep. the university has had a lot to do with that. And so kudos to her because I feel like her efforts and, of course, you know, your efforts alongside her. Like Averett has grown, I feel like, and just I, last time I was in downtown yeah. Danville, just the difference from the last time I was there, and I think she's just done a fantastic job up there. Well, I appreciate that. I I think you know I agree with you. I think she has, and I I think the the visibility uh, of Averett, it, you know, um, we both know David Lehman over at Starmount. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Tiff and I were over at Starmount, and uh, David came up and said uh, that about a week before. Uh, there was a young girl who came through the, the clubhouse. She had on an Averitt sweatshirt. And uh, David said, I know the president of Averitt, you know. And, and uh, she said, well, that's where I'm going to school. And, you know, so we're looking forward to, to meeting her when she gets up there this fall. But, you know, that's cool. And I've had a number of students, a few students from Grimsley uh, that went to Averitt. And, uh, you know, um, very, very proud of that. Awesome. If you did not get into the education and coaching field, what would Coach Franks have done? Wow. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, because, you know, when, when I went to Clemson in 78, one of the things that Clemson basically required was that you had to declare a major right away. Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, wanted, I, I enjoyed being an athletic trainer, and I thought maybe that's what I would, would want to do. So what am I going to major in? So I started out in Recreation and Parks Administration. Well, that lasted for a semester, okay? And then I went into business. Well, they're just majoring business, right? Business, that lasted a year and a half, okay? And then I saw education as a means to an end. It would allow me, you know, it wasn't that I had this great passion to be a teacher. It allowed me to continue my pursuit of enjoying sports medicine and athletic training. And what I found in, in the teaching, there was a, a profound, I, I guess it was, I don't know, eight, 10 years in, that teaching became a whole lot more important than the other things uh, that I was doing. Not to say that athletic training and coaching, that was you know fan, really important, um, but education, became the number one and I felt like I was doing what I was meant to do to be honest with you I have no clue what I would have done otherwise uh, I just I really haven't thought about that uh, because education was such a great fit I you know who knows I might have pursued you know trying to become an athletic trainer in college maybe yeah. because I really you know I, I love that from what I was doing um, at that time, and I had looked at a couple of GA positions, uh, and it just it was a blessing the way everything opened back up for me to get back to Grimsley. It's crazy. I think we're all very fortunate, speaking for myself too, that education and athletics were the route that you did end up going. Absolutely, and appreciate that. I don't know that there's anybody that I know that's done it better. So, uh, that's awesome, and we're very appreciative that you did go that route. Is it, you know, is it the Mark Twain quote about the two most important days in your life, the day that you're born and then the day that you find out why you were born? And I think I'm attributing that to Mark Twain. Somebody can, you know, Google that or, or whatever. It, that's a profound statement because well, if we don't I mean, know if it was Mark Twain and we can't find it, we're now coining it. Coach Frank said, "Well, it. that's fine. Somebody, <laughs> somebody very famous said it, but you know that that's profound. And uh, when you find find your purpose, find your purpose. It was just like um, <laughs> we watched the Les Brown video in psychology, mm -hmm. okay? And and Les Brown's a motivational speaker, and and uh, as a matter of fact, Kevin Kemp's. Mom is the one that gave me the VHS tape of, uh, yeah, no joke, it's no just, joke. Everything's just so full circle. But, but it is, so it is. Fun. But, you know, she gave me the tape, and I was able to use that tape of Les Brown 
uh, doing this program. It lasted about 45 minutes called You Deserve. And, you know, I mean, it was a, a great motivator about, and one of the things he said, find your purpose in life. Find something you love to do and continue to do that. That's, yeah. that's huge. You got you to love what you're doing. Uh, I love that and could not agree any more with any other statement. Uh, <laughs> it, it, so many people, successful people, you see them and they're just not happy. Yeah, it, it, like, you know, that's you're right. There are an awful lot of people that wake up every morning and they are miserable about what they're going to do for that day. Yeah. Hey, find something else to do. Find something. Find your passion. Find what you love to do, and then see if you can make a career doing what you love to do. Yeah, you know. and I think the internet and social media has made that much easier to do. You know, everything's at your fingertips. Um, I'm a big Gary Vee fan, and, and, you know, love him or hate him, his style is definitely different. But for somebody that's just like, look, if you like to grow plants, grow plants for a living and just get on the Internet and talk about it. That's the old thing. Bloom where you're planted, baby. Yeah. I mean, you know. Somebody will find you, want to follow you, and it, it just opens up opportunities. That's it. Uh, all right. I know the answer to this. Favorite sport to watch, of course, other than football and golf. You think you know this. Oh, okay. I think I know this. IndyCar racing. That's okay. That's what I was thinking. Because I married into tickets, right? You yeah. know, Tiffany and I started dating in 1994. As a matter of fact, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary of our first date, okay? Congrats. But, but thank you. But one of the things that, that was important to her father at the time was that who was going out with her daughter with his daughter? Did they enjoy the things that her family enjoyed? And she had gone to the Indianapolis 500. Her dad had taken her from Columbus, Ohio, as a young girl. So you know, and I fell in love with it. That was 1994. I still remember Al Hunter Jr. won it. They were running the Mercedes Benz engines that were just totally dominant. Um, it was unbelievable, and I fell in love with it. And now, for for our family you know i've been 30 years right to to the indy 500 and we go up on thursday we eat dinner at saint elmo's in indianapolis on friday we go to the track for carb day on saturday i've developed friendship with the guys at the brickyard crossing golf course and we've got a foursome two guys from indiana one guy from canada and me and and we play the day before the race, we play at the Brickyard, and that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then we go that night. We stay with Tiffany's cousin in Greenfield, Indiana. And you remember the name Andrew Carnegie, right? Everybody remembers mm -hmm. the name Andrew Carnegie, mm -hmm. you know, one of the big uh, industrialists and, and, you know, financiers and everything. Um, Andrew Carnegie put libraries all over the United States and funded those. And when the county up in Greenfield, Ohio, and the county was going to build a public library, well, this building that Andrew Carnegie had, had built for a library, it was, it was empty. Somebody bought it, repurposed it, made a restaurant out of it called Carnegie's, and that's our tradition for eating Saturday night before the race. And then we go to the race on Sunday, on, you know, and then you come back on Memorial Day. So that's awesome. Very special. You used to give extra credit around that somehow, and I don't yeah, remember. You know, I, I, I did offer some extra credit, you know, years ago when, uh, you know, Clemson had never won in basketball in Chapel Hill. <laughs> and uh, I used to offer that, you know, and never had to pay up. And, you know, here you've got, you know, Clemson's won the last two out of three that they've been in Chapel Hill. Rub it in. You know, well, no, I'm not Rub trying. But then yeah, yeah. what did I read? They're talking about maybe building and building another – uh, you know, basketball facility in Chapel Hill. Did you read that? I haven't yet. Yeah, I, I read some about somebody floated that idea, and I said, "Oh yeah, okay." Clemson wins two out of three, and now you're talking about building a new, you know, well, building a new Dean Dome. Well, we can't say that Clemson's never beat us in the Dean Dome, now, <laughs> right? Wow, that's one of the most iconic plays. I mean, I know, you know it's the cool thing about the Dean Dome is if, if you look at it schematically. It's like they took a basketball court and then just went and built a stadium around 
the basketball court because every the, the excuse me the sight lines you know are are so good geared in on that it's a it's a fantastic venue there's no doubt about that I it's, I love watching basketball there you know I everybody makes fun of us we've got this whole Southern banker crowd I know we're not over there getting crazy like uh, what do they call that place down the road what's it um, Oh, you know, I think Duke plays basketball. Anyway, we'll we'll move on. We'll move on. From <laughs> Cameron now. is a pretty cool Cam- place to oh, see a yeah, game, Cameron though. Cameron is there. a pretty cool place to see a game, though. It is. It is. I've been fortunate. I haven't seen a Duke Carolina game there, but it, it is, a. I admit, it's a fun place to watch basketball. Um, your coaching style. One word to describe it. What would it be? Wow. Um, encouraging. You know, I, I think you, you've got to find something positive in what anybody does. Uh, I had a coach from another school one time we were coaching. He, he was coaching the girls. I was coaching the girls. And, you know, I had a uh, one, and I can't remember who the, who the young lady was, but she made a great putt for a double bogey, okay? And I was like, you know, so excited about that. Yeah, you did great. And he's going, she made a double bogey. What are you excited? I said, she made a great putt. You've got to find something to get excited about. Yeah. You know, um, I think it was, it, it was all about, you know, being excited, being a motivator, uh, and being positive. I love that. And I'm going <laughs> to, excuse me, I'm going to throw in a little Tiger Woods play here, too. You know, growing up watching Tiger's my favorite golfer. He's still my favorite golfer. And you always knew when he made that 15 foot par putt or that 20-foot bogey putt yep. that saved that shot, he just got a different look in his eye. Absolutely. It was like, let's go. Yep. So even in a situation like that, being encouraging to yourself, and it can change the trajectory of what you're doing. That's I love that. And, yes, you were very encouraging. Uh, best advice you've ever received? Oh, man. The, the best advice that I ever received was to be yourself. Quit worrying about what everybody else thinks. Quit worrying about what everybody else says. Be yourself. Be happy with yourself. Be comfortable with yourself. And be yourself. You know. So that was the best advice I ever got. I love it. I agree. Authent- authenticity. It's a hard <laughs> word for me to say. And, and especially in these scenarios right here, you know, it, it, for me, starting this podcast, I guess what I wanted to do. Right. And if five people watch and enjoy it, or 8,000 people watch and enjoy sure. it, I want to sit here with people that I love and respect and just be myself. Absolutely. So I, I love hearing you say that. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit because right. uh, you've written a book, correct? I was, you know, I was fortunate to, to co write a book with Dr. Herb Appenzeller when he was still alive. And, and Herb is an absolute, I mean, legend. In, uh, in the sports community, at Guilford College, at Chowan, at, at, you know, he's, uh, he was an expert in um, sports liability in trying to help people, you know, minimize uh, the legal stuff. He wrote books on, you know, legal aspects of sports, taught uh, many classes. Um, Herb had always said, you know, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I said, I don't know how to write a book. I said, you, you're the one you know, that has written all these books. And he said, okay, we'll do it together. So we did. We sat down, and uh, we kind of played off of of each other. We took a topic, and then, you know, um, I would expand on it, and then Herb would give his thoughts, and or he would hit a topic, and then he would give his thoughts, and I would would do that. Um, And we we titled the book. uh, He said, he said, what do you want to call it? And I said, you know, unintended consequences. You know, because you never know the, the decisions that you're going to make. How is that going to be a ripple effect? It's like throwing a, a rock in a pond, you know. And some unintended consequences are fantastic, and other unintended consequences may not be. But it was basically a book about years in education and what, what I learned uh, from, from being an educator, an athletic trainer, and a coach. And uh, so, yeah, we were able to do that. And I was, I was very, very, uh, am very, very proud of that. I'm tickled. Awesome. I, um, you answered my follow-up question there, so we'll just skate by that. But I think that's pretty cool. And again, you know, a testament 
to somebody like that to sit down and go, man, this, this guy's got something to say. Yeah. Especially on these notes. And I appreciated that. I, I had yeah. never thought about that. And, uh, you know, he was the one that, uh, you know, that said, yeah, you need to do it. So the community aspect of high school sports. Right. You know, obviously in this area, we know that, especially the last couple of years, the football team has been fantastic. Unbelievable. And we know how I see the golf community that's been built around Grimsley and bringing in that Grimsley page aspect yeah. and how we've fundraised for years and, you know, I mean, packing out Brian Parks, both their golf that, courses absolutely. numerous times. What do you feel like in this area doesn't have to be Grimsley specific? What does the athletic community mean to the community and, and, and how does that bring people together? Well, I think, you know, high school sports, it's, it's, a, it's a pure form of sport. You've got kids that are, that are doing this because they love it, they live it, they're playing for their school. Um, and, you know, there are an awful lot of people that live in neighborhoods that, that went to the school and they're going to follow their school. They may have a kid that, that goes, or they may have a, a, a child of a, of a friend that goes to the school, and so there's a natural there's a natural interest. Okay, when you start to become successful, then things blossom. If you go back and look at the 1980s, okay, it was Marion Kirby and Page football. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, they won state championships. They they had they had a tremendous run. There was a lot of excitement in the Greensboro community, you know, and now. You look what Daryl Brown has done at Grimsley, you know, when, when he came over here uh, from Southern Guilford. And uh, one of the cool things, and I'll just tell you this little story. I, the first time I met Daryl, um, I just said, congratulations. And I said, you know, you know how special you are, don't you? And he was like, what do you mean? The administration at Grimsley brought in, they had, they had teaching positions. And, and brought in members of his staff to have teaching positions, okay? And I said, the only other person that I've known that, that was able to do that was Henry Van Sant back in 1976. And I think one of the things that Marion Kirby, his success at Greensboro Page, he had a consistent staff, okay? And they were teachers at the school, all right? And so you got to have people that are teaching at your school so that they can they know the players, they see the players in school that, you know, and and I think it's paid off. Um, it, it really has, uh, you know, and, and that when when you've got a successful football team, it spreads into other sports. OK, you've got uh, I, the right currently the Grimsley basketball team, you know, is rocking it. OK. You know, like a conference champion, all right, regular season. The, the wrestling team, you know, conference champion. Women's swimming, conference champion. They're a buzz about what's happening at the school based off of what's happening in athletics, you know. And, and that's really cool. I think we're seeing that. And, and it, hey, look, it goes in cycles, okay? It goes in cycles. Grimsley is on a real high right now. And, and I think that, that uh, the community's involved. I also think that when Ethan Albright came back to Grimsley, um, he had a lot of, you know, first of all, he had name recognition. I mean, the guy played in the NFL for 16 years, right? He played here at Grimsley, played football, basketball, and baseball. But he had things that he wanted to do. And everybody, you know, that he had friends that he could touch base with to say, help me do this. Help me get, help Grimsley. Help me help Grimsley. Okay? I think you're seeing the benefit of that. I don't think there's any doubt about it. He's done a tremendous job. I would agree. And, you know, still having a personal network that involves a lot of folks that have been Grimsley alumni. Yep. And maybe not Grimsley alumni, but have moved to the area. Maybe their kids go here now. Right. The last couple of years, it's just a different conversation. You know, in my mid-20s, we weren't talking about 
hey, you're going to go check out the Grimsley Page game. It's right. Like, oh, it's cool. Maybe we'll go back. But now it's like, hey, they're in the state playoffs. Do you want to, you want to drive to Charlotte and watch exactly. them play football? No and doubt it, about it. And it is. It's just a different buzz. It's a conversation. And I've been super impressed with what Ethan and the coach have done as well. Yep. And uh, to hear that wrestling is a sport I did as well, conference champs, basketball conference champs, girls swimming conference champs, Hopefully, soon to be men's golf conference. Yeah, and that'll work. But yeah. you know, you mentioned I mentioned basketball, and you know, Darren Corbett has done a fantastic job. And and Darren was here at Grimsley, and then had a chance to to go and pursue one of his dreams, you know, in college, and that you know, and that transitioned back, and and he was in Fayetteville, I believe, for a while, and then the Grimsley job opened up again, and he had the opportunity to come back. And, you know, here's the one thing about Darren. Darren teaches English, and he's a heck of an English teacher. And, uh, you know, but so when we lost him, you know, yeah, he was a great basketball coach, but he was a great teacher, too. So we're just, you know, really, really happy that, that he was able to come back, um, you know, and he's done a fantastic job. And uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Coach Corbett was here when I was in school. I think That's so. That's when he, he kind of came in. I think so. Right in that early 2000 era. Yep. And, and I, I remember him then. You couldn't miss him in the hallway. That's true. Uh, very tall gentleman. And no <laughs> doubt about it. Uh, but yeah, like that that's fantastic. And I couldn't get through this without calling you out for this. Go ahead. If you didn't know, Jamison Stadium's football field <laughs> is named Coach Joe Frank's football field. <laughs> and so well deserved. Tell us about how you find out how that came about and what it meant to you to have such a recognition in the well, community. Well, first of all, it's surreal. Okay. Um, it came about because of the effort of a math teacher here at Grimsley named Kemp Dalton. And Kemp is a, a very, very dear friend. We're very close. And uh, Kemp, I mean, unbeknownst to me, you know, Kemp said, Joe's going to retire. We got to do something for Joe. And he touched base, I think, with a gentleman named Jeff Belton, who was on the school board at the time. And Jeff told Kemp what what he needed to do. And Kemp, you know, organized some things and got people to speak and all that. And then, um, you know, I got obviously when people had to speak at the school board, you know, that's when I started getting rumblings about what have you done, I mean, kind of thing. And uh, but it, it is it, it is a uh, it's a tremendous honor. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, I, I guess for for me, besides see it being surreal, it it validates the years that I that I spent here and the relationships that I was able to forge here and the students that I was able to to teach and work with here. You know, I thought about when I retired. I've probably had, you know, 4,500 students over 30 years. Because my class, I had 150, you know, every year, if not more. Um, I, was one, I was one of these people that just irritated the mess out of the guidance office because you're supposed to have your, you know, your classes were going to be capped at a certain number, and I would have students come by and say, is there any way I can get in? Is there any way? I said, yeah, we'll stick in the back. Go talk to them, see if they'll let you in. You know, it was like, Joe, quit doing that, you know, kind of thing. Um, but I felt, excuse me, I felt like, you know, it, if they wanted to be in there, and that was one of the, the cool things, teaching an elective, you have students that signed up for your class because they wanted to be in there. It wasn't like they got put in there. Yeah. And so you, you were one step ahead of the game because you had students that wanted to be in there. And then... The, the job was to make it, to, to validate them and their choice to be in my class. So, but yeah, yeah right. I, the, the field is just, I mean, I can't believe it, Andrew. I mean, every time I, you know, we go to the East West football game in December and I look up the scoreboard and boom, there it is, you know, and um, uh, it's just, um, it's an awesome honor. It really is. And well deserved. And you, you mentioned a name in there. And, you know, another Grimsley teaching legend, Kim Dalton. Absolutely. Mr. Dalton. Everybody had Mr. Dalton for math. I mean. And uh, fantastic educator. You know, but here, here's, here's the deal. Every principal that would come in 
And, and I had 10 principals over my 30 years, but principals that would come in and Kemp was teaching math and Kemp had his way of teaching math. He had his way. We both had our way of decorating our classroom, right? Mm-hmm. It didn't look like a classroom. You couldn't, I mean, I had, they, they couldn't give the SAT in my classroom because it was too much visual distraction, right? His classroom was the same way. I mean, he had the posters and he had the music posters and he had stuff up on the ceiling and it was just, you know, but he had a certain way of teaching. I had a certain way of teaching. It wasn't in the box. And, and for so many, particularly young administrators, that, you know, they wanted you to teach a certain way and they wanted you to do this and they wanted you to do that. You know, when, if you've got a teacher that is successful, they have demonstrated that they have relationships with the students and that they're productive relationships and those productive relationships develop productive students. Yeah. Then, hey, let them go. Let them do what they're supposed to do. Let them do what they do naturally. And that was the cool thing about Kemp and mathematics. No I, doubt. I would agree. I would agree. And that, that's a great segue into my final question. What advice would you give those young administrators, <laughs> educators, and coaches that don't just want to show up to do their job, but they truly want to make an impact on the students and the people around them from the teachers to the counselors to any employee at the school from a janitorial level to the cafeteria what so, advice would you give those folks you know i, th- I think um one of the things particularly for a young teacher or a young administrator who makes your campus run okay it's the people in the it's the office staff it's the janitorial staff okay work get to know these people get to know these folks they're part of your campus they're an important part of your campus okay and for any administrator one the most successful principals that came in during my tenure um they sat back they watched how things worked and then after a year or so, then they started tweaking things a little bit. So anyway, get, getting back to the young administrator or, the, or, or even an experienced administrator. Yeah, I understand that an administrator comes in and they want to put their stamp on the school. Okay? But everybody, their teachers aren't cookie cutters. And one of the things that really distressed me was when, uh, and it wasn't just Guilford County Schools, it was, you know, it, it was a trend in education. They came up with this thing called, and here I am going off on a tangent, bear with Go. me, there's a point. Go. They came up with this thing called a pacing guide that basically, you're in school for 180 days. You're supposed to spend two days on this and three days on that and four days on that and two days on this and three days on that. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is, the, that is one of the dumbest concepts that I think they ever came up in education. Because some administrator or curriculum facilitator or whoever at a state level said, this is where we need to be and we want to keep all the teachers on the same path so that This class is teaching this today, and this class is teaching this today. I'm sorry, folks. That's not reality, and that's ridiculous. And so I had some young administrators when I was, you know, a seasoned, experienced teacher. I'd have some young administrators, you know, well, Mr. Franks, uh, you're you're way ahead of, of where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Tell me something I don't know. It's intentional. I want to get to a certain point. I know how to get there. I know how to get the kids there. Let me do my thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not going to fit in your box. Well, I, I you think know? you can take that so, so much further out of the classroom too. And I, I'll just hearing you talk. It's like, all right, two days here, three days here. Well, take the subject. It's two days. 
the classroom of folks that you're in, if everybody in that classroom grasps that concept at a high level in half a day, what are you doing the other one and a half days? Where that concept that you allotted three days for, what if it took them four or five days to really learn and grasp that concept? Exactly. You can't just be like, well, this is no. two days, this is three days, this is, yeah. You I, gotta have the flexibility. That would have drove me up a wall. <laughs> Goodness. Not that I'm an educator, but no. But but, but what, I'm, but what I'm saying is, you know, you over, over the years, you find things that work, you know, and it's the old adage: if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix, fix it, it. Yeah. you know. And, and it's the same thing, you know, get, getting into coaching. Where do you want to be, and how are you going to get there? You got to have your steps to to get there. Yeah. You know, um, that it's so coaching is teaching. So you might not be an educator, but here you are. You're, you're a young man that was a Bryan Invitational champion. You played on a state, you know, state runner-up team at Grimsley High School. Now you're you know, a successful businessman, but you're a fourth-year assistant coach at Grimsley with a golf team. How good is that? It's awesome. I mean, I it's, it. it's just, you know, it's just cool, okay? It's just cool. I love it. You know. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and I had a pretty good mentor too. So, <laughs> you know, and shout out to Coach Tim. Coach Tim's great. Love love working alongside him. He was a hand picked replacement when I when I retired. He really he's a good was dude. because he was coaching at another school, and I just felt like his personality, his way of doing things. And I'm talking about Tim Samalek. Yeah. Um, you know, I just felt like he would be a great person to take over the program at Grimsley uh, when I retired. And, and um, you know, Tim came in and was an assistant coach with us for a year, my last year, so that he could learn the kids, see how we'd done it. He had his ideas of doing it because he had been a coach at another school. and uh, But he's an, he is an, an instructor, you know, precision golf and you know tim knows the swing and tim can teach the swing mm -hmm. all right joe franks wasn't a swing instructor all right if there was an obvious flaw i could mention it what i did was try to work on course management okay strategy staying positive you know and i think the success that we had i think it paid off yeah my, my favorite coach frank's course management story to tell is I think it was my junior year, maybe senior year. We were playing in regionals at uh, Bermuda run. Okay. And you know, I, in my later years in high school, I somehow developed the way to just hit the crap out of the ball uh, before people were hitting at 300. And it wasn't anything special. It just happened and it happened overnight. And I get a little wild with it sometimes. And I remember walking off the bus <laughs> And you, you took my driver out of my bag. Oh, yeah. And I, threw oh, it yeah. back on the bus. I did. I said, you're not so hitting your driver today. Forget hitting. it. You're not hitting it. We're going to take it out of the bag. And did I go out and break a course record? No. I think I shot in the mid-70s, but I didn't make any T-ball mistakes that would have cost me extra shots. Absolutely. And that day, that's what we that's needed what to do. That's what you needed. That's what you we You may needed not have day. known you needed that. Yeah. But here again, that that was you know that was a gut reaction on my part, and it paid off. Sometimes yeah. you have gut reactions that don't pay off, but yeah. but that one did, and that it was, was pretty good. good. And then and then carrying that story further, we took that theory in the states that year, and then on the second round of states, you said just hit it hard, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just let go, it go, man, it just let it go. <laughs> and uh, I I love that. We're gonna wrap up here, Coach, and and this is this was a special. Special episode for me, and I just thank you so much for sitting down. Well, you've uh, you've meant a lot to a lot of people, and you know if, if if you don't get told that enough, you should. It's it's just such an honor to sit here with you and and hear some of your stories, and and just have this moment. And I thank you so much. Well, I'm proud of you, and I love you, and I appreciate the opportunity. I love it's you been too. great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. That'll wrap. You want me to say something to the camera? You want to say something to the people? Bye. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm good with an I love you and, <laughs> and letting that one, we can cut. <laughs>